the oh, and we will be recording the meeting. So if you want not to be recorded, go ahead and black yourself out or um, but we are going to report record this for uh, posterity to share with those who aren't able to attend. My name is Michael Tim. I am a writer and manager of the Milwaukee Water Stories program for the nonprofit Reflow. And we're joining together in this virtual roundtable, which is the fourth of its kind over the last year, supported by uh, a grant from Wisconsin Coastal Management Program uh, to support Great Lakes education. And uh, what the resource is, is what I'll be spending about 15, 20 minutes describing to you all here. But if you aren't aware already, if you haven't uh, stumbled up upon the web page or seen any of the articles that have been printed to date or uh, the artwork that has been supported thus far. This is the um, website where we are anchoring all of the resource or the resources, and it would be a good thing to bookmark uh, for future reference. But I'll for this soon, I'll be going over um, what is found there. So you don't need to spend your time on that concurrently, but you're welcome to if you want to. Um, the overview of this project, uh, which again is part of the Milwaukee Water Stories program, involves a number of facets of this resource. Feature articles, illustrated stories, interactive maps and short videos, all that support the storytelling um, that is uh, has been su uh, suggested by these quarterly roundtables. So we've had uh, three of these, two of them uh, more robust than, than one, where folks like you who've shown up have had ideas and pitched them and some of those I was able to follow up on and some of those I am still following up on and some of those didn't fit exactly what we're situated to do under the terms of this grant, but it all created a kind of a fertile discussion point for different viewpoints around water in Milwaukee. And so that in and of itself is kind of part of this resource. Uh, and then bundling it all together, uh, the expectation is to design uh, the articles and the illustrations and the photos into sort of a National Geographic style compendium of this volume one of Milwaukee Water Stories. So taking the, the pieces of this resource one by one and providing a high level overview for the next five or so minutes, um, what's the status of the future articles? Uh, six of them have been published so far. One has been submitted and is uh, waiting for publication. And there's another seven or more that are in motion in some way. So we had proposed doing at least 12 and we are on pace to, to meet that expectation. Um, these are screenshots of the stories that have been uh, published in urban Milwaukee thus far. And uh, these are the headlines of those stories. The first three kind of gathered themselves into a theme that I called a fish story. And the next three, as our illustrator, Sarah Gail Luther can well attest uh, by being involved in that storytelling process, we gathered under the bundle of like too salty. So they're independent stories, they live in and of themselves through urban Milwaukee, through links that you can find through our, our master link, but they also kind of had these larger arcs. Um, with the last 2.5 months of the story series, given all the energy and, and story ideas that have been submitted thus far, each of the articles coming forward may not fit nicely into those kind of three-part arcs, but there's still a, a lot of great work to, to be done. Uh, I will note that also at the first round table, it was suggested to use the water centric city principles as a guiding lens for like how we would divide up the time of what kind of stories could be considered. And I've bolded the one, the themes that uh, those first six stories have really touched on pretty well. Um, and the remaining themes are ones that are kind of emphasized for exploration in the next suite of stories, which again, were supported by ideas that were shared at, at these round tables. Um, or through conversations that happen because of the, of the conversations at the roundtables. So this is sort of the, the near-term docket, near-term being two and a half months, not necessarily that tomorrow any of these are going to drop, they won't, but this is what I'm working on uh, on the writing side of things. And then some of these were also um, packaging into illustrated support stories. So what, what have the illustrated stories look like to date? We've created two of them, working with two different very talented local illustrators. Um, and then there's another two that have been scoped and I'm working with Sarah Gail Luther, who will, I'll give a little time to, to chat on, on some of the draft work here, which is also exciting um, shortly. But they're the two that have been created and are in the world that can be used or leveraged and adapted 
are um, one kind of in parallel with that fish story arc um, that looked at the implications of the clutch dam fishway for increased fish passage and what that means for all of us and education and like the long term story of the Milwaukee River and our relationship to it. Uh, Sydney Hoffman put that all into a really a nice uh, uh, booklet. And then Sarah worked to digest a number of the sewer pack chloride impact reports that were suggested at the very first roundtable as, hey, we've got sewer pack is writing hundreds and hundreds of pages of these technical reports. What can you do about doing an article about this? And we um, we thought about that and dug into those and did some independent research. And that led to um, kind of providing a digest. So this is a, an image pulled from that uh, I am a river booklet to show those who aren't familiar an example of a page spread that kind of um, shows you how our National Geographic ethos is also working its way into the illustrated components. This is showing you cross sections of the Milwaukee River with a highlight to the Clutch Dam and the fishway as how important it is to allow fish passage upstream of the dam, but for an audience that may have never heard of Clutch Park. Uh, and then this is a, uh, a zoom in of the um, life and time of sodium chloride that Sarah and I worked on. And uh, we're looking just at one part of that document, but Sarah also created um, an annotated backside that gives us like, if we were to click on these things, like the highlight of the different stories of salt in our world and how that relates to water. I know I'm throwing a lot at you here, but I want to go through this slide and segue to Sarah to unmute and then say a few words because what's exciting is that in addition to the work that's been created to date, we're in progress on some really exciting work to support stories that are being researched currently. Um, and this is one of those that actually has a lot of relevance because we just had a water drop alert yesterday due to um, the, the extent of the rain that was causing challenges for the sewer system. So Sarah, I'd like to invite you to kind of say a few words about what we're looking at here and what your process has been to date. So thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, this is what you're looking at is one of probably about 10 pages of a small comic book about the story of Rapid Radicals, which is a company that's helping create like an interruption to the overflow system right now in Milwaukee to try to quickly clean any overflow water that goes into the rivers. Um, so Michael's been kind of giving me the lowdown on the business end of this story. And we're trying to communicate how this business has been op operating and developed and use that kind of as a vehicle. I feel passionate about using that as a vehicle to also just tell the story of the Milwaukee sewer system um, and how the traditional system of cleaning our wastewater works. Um, so this is a page that kind of gives an overview of like a big overview of the sewer system, uh, the wastewater treatment plant as it exists today. But then it's also being questioned um, by Paige and her um, professor at Marquette um, as kind of a way to show how they're innovating um, out of this system and to try to be a little bit more, um, try to interrupt the system where it needs more solutions and you can go to the next page. Um, so the next page is at like from a photograph of they're actually testing this pod on the Milwaukee or sorry on the Menominee River. Um, so it's kind of like a cutout of what's happening inside the pod showing the pod in place at um, on State Street um, helping like test this new way of cleaning overflow. Um, and so, yeah, again, just kind of pairing like what's already happening, what the structure is of our sewer system with this story, this great story of innovation in Milwaukee. Um, there'll also be some pages about how the current system that we use is like incredibly innovative and really was um, big at the time that it was implemented. And then kind of how this system also has the possibility to disrupt that old system and really have bigger um, impact on our city or like globally um, as a new way of treating wastewater. Um, so yeah, trying to tackle a lot of content, but in a few, just a few pages and trying to bring up some cool ideas um, or make, you know, wastewater treatment a little bit more accessible, digestible, exciting. Um, and through this really great story of Paige and her process. 
Okay. Yeah, so that's a great a great segue. Um, and the what I'll add to that is that Rapid Radical showed up at our first roundtable to kind of participate and share a little bit about their story. Um, I wasn't able to write a story immediately about their press conference that this photo with the scissors is coming from. But we are um, we have maintained pretty good communication with their team over the ensuing months, and we're hopeful that there will be some news worthy hook happening within the next month that can be a reason to kind of come out with this story. But as Sarah mentioned, and as this first slide kind of illustrates, and Sarah, this is really to Sarah's credit that she went above and beyond to kind of, hey, I want to diagram the sewer system. Like, okay, well, let's see how we can do that, put it into a context that also has a narrative. Um, so the, these are both stories that will be shareable to anyone, including young audiences but also sort of visual assets that can be used to point out different parts of um, the systems and our relationship to them. So that's how we're approaching this uh, as, a, as a larger resource. Um, I wanna speed through the next slides, but, but do remind folks that the resource is even more than the words and the pictures. Um, the other way in which um, some of this content is accessed, and it's essentially the same quote unquote content, but it's accessed in a different mode which is through interactive maps. And so part of the salt story, for example, is where does our salt come from? How much is it? Where does it go? And this is um, a simple interactive map that tunnels folks into different aspects of that story, but, but showing how that's located on the Great Lakes. And then this is an example of a map that um, highlights the, the fish passage situation on the Milwaukee River, because, you know, we can focus on what's happening in Glendale and Clutch Park, but really there's a lot of other parts to that river that are important to fish. And while this is not comprehensive of everything, it gives us a sense of, oh, there's other interventions that have been happening over time. What are they? What what are the barriers? What have been overcome? And how do we connect down here in, in Milwaukee to the Milwaukee River, which, which is part of the Milwaukee River watershed? So these interactive maps were part of our proposal. The, the videos I won't talk much on because we're kind of waiting until all the assets are in play to bundle those together into really short pieces. Uh, and they, they may be kind of cool things, but they are, have not been drafted yet. And so I don't have a lot of, of collateral to share, except that all the collateral that's been developed from the other parts of the process will feed into these with the view of making very short pieces that can have a longer duration as this sort of public informational context. Um, what does that look like when you put it all together? Uh, it looks something like this, which is if you imagine like you've thrown your National Geographic at the wall and all the pages have come out. Um, as, as we've been writing these articles, although in urban Milwaukee, it's great to get it out there to an audience because they have an audience and people read it and they comment on it and they think about it. Um, I'm, I'm really pursuing this series as a whole. And so this, this slide gives us an example of how the visuals integrate with the quantitative analysis, with the illustrated components and the stories and the maps to kind of really take a National Geographic approach to those water-centric city principles across different stories in Milwaukee. Um, and this is something that folks other than Reflow haven't really seen, so I can appreciate that it may be like, what is he talking about? But this is a taste of what we're talking about, and we're looking forward to sharing that PDF uh, in a couple months. So the other end of this resource is us. It's the people. It's the, I'm not sure how many folks are on this call. Is it, um, sorry, I can't, uh, 21. Okay, it's the 21 of us who have come together to share 20 minutes, half hour to kind of think about these things. And I want to segue to the Reflow team because th they've put together a, a jam board which is if you participated in the prior roundtables, we're gonna do it a little differently today. In the prior ones we did, we invited folks to kind of have the floor and present and then have a feedback session. Uh, we'll see how this goes. It's always an experiment, but uh, it's been suggested, well, why don't we open it up to like, everyone can kind of have the same space. Uh, and so I think in the chat, we are putting a Jamboard link. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that, but then I'll also, um, I'll continue to share my screen because I think that's probably still meaningful for those who aren't on the board. But if you want to go to your chat and then click on this link, it should let you into the shared space. 
And these are just like post-it notes and you can do whatever you want in this page. You can't break anything, um, but feel free to uh, suggest, hey, there's an event coming up. Do you wanna go and cover it? Or, hey, what about this theme? Or one up or, or circle or dry arrows. You can do whatever Google lets you do on this page. And I wanna to segue to Justin, cause Justin, you have more experience using the Jamboard. What's a good way to think about how we can engage with this space? Yeah, I think, um, um, yeah, so it's like a, a digital uh, bulletin board. So maybe Michael, if you just show us on the left-hand side, how to how to click on a post-it note and just kind of walk us. Can I remove the the blue smiley face? Yeah, so, yeah that, it, yeah. you're always able to remove a smiley face, Justin. <laughs> Um, but if you if you just show us how to how to create a post-it note, then if you welcome. if you click on this thing, it brings up for me a sticky note, and then if I hit save, it puts it there, and then if I click off of it, it's it's there. I put the blue ones there if folks wanted to use them. These are the yellow are ones that people had mentioned to me either in an email that they couldn't come or in an email or a conversation about events from past events. So that's what's here, not to, and also in case. We were slow to get started. The fact that there are other ideas that aren't encapsulated by the other stories, um, but feel free to grab a post-it note, uh, click on it, and then if you double-click on it, you should be able to say, um, you should be able to put it down, and then, uh, and then I guess the idea is we can we can all see this here um, additively, and if. Um, if we wanted to do a different color, then we would see all the ones that are coming from today. Um, but it doesn't really matter. So, and yeah, and Michael, the the our conversation with organizing this activity today was um, the current grant through Wisconsin Coastal Management. Um, we have a lot of stories, as Michael um, communicated, that have been um, kind of put in the queue for the remaining couple of months left on this existing grant and. This exercise is an attempt to try to figure out if um, we should be pursuing future grants to continue this type of storytelling and um, kind of continue building this resource for um, Southeastern Wisconsin. So I see the Fair and Future Movement is doing some good work related to access locally. Um, that's awesome. Does anyone who shared that want to pipe up and share more about it? I can Google that fair and future movement. Hi, that was me. It's Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Um, I joined there. They're doing a book club um, and they're having us read the uh, intersectional environmentalism book. Uh, they're working on becoming a 50C3 nonprofit. Um, but they're doing a good job with sort of one-on-one -on -one in very small neighborhoods and houses, um, gathering people to talk about better access to better water in Milwaukee. Um, I know there's a lot of them, um, groups doing that. Uh, they have a good website and they do good outreach, especially through things like their book clubs and their, um, their board to talk about intersectional environmentalism. Cool. And I, I was taken in a couple of different directions as you're talking. Could I remind you said you joined a book club to this extent? That's your direct contact with them right now? Uh, yes. And the Milwaukee Community Sailing Center is um, interested in being a partner with them. So um, but I think let me grab their. Their website is fairandfuturemovement.com. Um, and they're partnered with, uh, oh, you guys. <laughs> Reflow's on their list of people. Um, the Wisconsin Green Muslims, Plastic Free MKE, Water Commons, Compost Kids, Milwaukee Environmental Consortium, Hummingbird. Cool. So all the usuals. Very cool. I'm um, seeing that folks are making use of this board, so thank you very much. I, I saw this one appear, I think, next. Disturbance on the AOC can be a favorable future for coastal fisheries. I'm guessing who that was, but uh, whoever put that one down, do you want to take the floor? I'm guessing that might have been Dr. Cool, but 
if that's okay if it's if it's unattributed uh, i'm well, seeing Dr. that Cole, a, you're muted sorry, right yeah. Uh, there we are. Yes. Okay. I found it now. Uh, so uh, what, what the idea is on this uh, is that during last summer, there was an interesting um, event, series of events that caused some substantial disturbance of sediments uh, in the Milwaukee River, which led to a tremendous um, increase in uh, set of juicy steaks for the food web diatoms that we have never seen uh, here in coastal Wisconsin at any extent. And they were so abundant that they prevented the DNR from doing their fish assessment because they clogged the nets. And it turns out that when you look downstream and offshore of the harbor, that the recruitment of young of the year and uh, forage fish was really good last year, which was associated with a big change in the uh, plankton composition of the harbor and the near shore. Very cool. And very succinctly put, thank you very much. I think that is, that is cool. And I would like to do something on this. And it's, from my perspective, it's a function of time and timing. But I, I appreciate you bringing that up because I think it's underappreciated. And I think it's one of these things that we use the word intersectional with the last post-it note, but this is a different kind of intersectional between you know different projects and different systems. So very cool. I'm seeing a lot of post-it notes pop up. So I'm trying to figure out the best way to prioritize new speakers. Um, humans of the Harbor, someone put, I see I'm acknowledging that one. Does whoever put that one to talk about that? That was me. I, um, the, the, the series of folks have seen it, humans of New York, um, kind of like a human interest, um, piece, but of Milwaukee and the Harbor. And, uh, it would, I think it would be interesting to see all the different, uh, folks that might be in engaging with in and around the, the Harbor, um, uh, Milwaukee, um, community sailing center. Um, it would just be interesting to just see the people that are kind of down and by the river and by the waterways. Sarah, you want to uh, mention some of the work that you're planning to do for, uh, it was suggested by Maddie uh, at the last round table that an interest in local fishing. And we haven't gotten too far into that, but I have made some inquiries and uh, Jenny, um, Jenny Tass at Menominee Valley Partners connected with me, connected me with uh, Zach uh, at DNR, who was sharing some resources about fishing. Um, and then different people had suggested different folks to, that we'll hopefully interact with just by going down to the harbor to talk to them. Sarah, I know you were interested in in doing that work. And we also I also had an email recently from Dave at Friends of Lakeshore State uh, Park uh, connecting me to Great Lakes um, fishermen um, or sports sports fishermen, sports fishers. And uh, I don't know, Sarah, if you want to mention yeah um we're just excited to um have the chance to just i i mean my plan for the spring is to just go out and start chatting with people who are doing um like some shoreline fishing and do some interviews and portraiture and kind of make almost like little baseball cards style um stamps of each of them so it's like a little bit of like statistics and a little bit of why they are there um, but then also include like a nice portrait and some drawings of the environment, um, just to collect like kind of an overview of who is using all of the different Milwaukee rivers or lakes for fishing. Um, and, but I, I've had the like opportunity to speak with Joe, who's a grad student who did a report on shoreline fishing. So I feel like my brain is there, but I feel like there are these opportunities for other people like using the Harbor in a different way or um, fishing from a boat or commercial fishing. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of opportunity there to just kind of use art as a tool to tell those stories. Thank you. Someone has mentioned, can we do a story in native Oji a language, Ojibwe? Uh, whoever posted that one, do you want to chime in? Hi, this is Carmen Aguilar. How are you? Um, Good, how are you? Yeah, so I took a, an Ojibwe class and part of our um, final grade was to do a story um, from um, 
from whatever we were interested in, of course, being interested in Lake Michigan, I did part of that. It was maybe like 10 slides in PowerPoint. And then it was in English and Ojibwe. So it got me thinking that probably if there is a theme that anybody would be interested, we could do something like that, even if it's a short story that we could do with, um, with a native language that is very well used in this area. And uh, so that was my idea. And um, yeah, so that was, uh, that was something that I wanted to ask you guys if you were interested in maybe we could pursue that. We have a student that is uh, fluent in Ojibwe and he just finished his dissertation, um, you know, work in history. I'd definitely be interested in that. Justin, did you want to mention the conversation that we were having recently um, with um, uh, Indian Community School and also um, some other uh, Indigenous leaders uh, about looking ahead? Could there be ways to engage young people with um, with uh, Native water storytelling? So I think that fits a lot with that, Carmen. So if, if there's a way fantastic. to, to yeah. do that in the short term as like a to demonstrate what's possible. So I don't speak yeah. or write Ojibwe, but like your student sounds like it'd be the perfect mix of Yeah, talents. he would be really good. So who would be, who was the person that you mentioned that was interested in the native stories? Well, we are, we're interested in exploring oh. it. And we, we, oh, really, okay. we know a couple of people. At, <laughs> I thought well, you had a person. Yeah, well, Jason at um, Indian Community School has been open to that, but thinking about it in the fall. No, so we're, we don't, we're thinking like they're really kind of booked right now in the spring. Um, yeah. but they were I could excited share my PowerPoint with you when we meet next week. So at least you see more or less what I um, I was thinking about. Yeah. And thank you, whoever's sorting the post-it notes. Please continue to do that because I'm kind of pulled in a couple of different uh, directions. But that, that's yeah, a great suggestion. Okay. Um, um, I'm seeing on the board, um, is this a new one? Impact of build environment in Lake Michigan since development of Veterans in McKinley Park. There are a lot of small pieces about it, but nothing new, I don't think, TC. Uh, does someone want to chime in on that one? I think that might be new. That might be slightly different than what's been discussed. Hi, that was me again, Teresa. Um, hey, Teresa. Um, and it's mostly because when we, when the sailing center takes part in a lot of conversations about the harbor, um, and about the parks, we I, I tend to have to remind people that where we are built is not natural. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, it's awesome that it's here and it's part of the access that Milwaukee has to have veterans and McKinley here, but um we're we're landfill. Um and it'd just be interesting to know more about how, you know, we don't do a lot of water testing in some of these areas because they're not natural and they don't flow from we're just getting flow from random places. Um and I know lots of people know lots more than I do about it. I just, I work here um, on, on the landfill. Um, but I think a more comprehensive look at it or a different story or a different angle. So um, I don't know, more than just the history of, yes, it was built. Anybody on the call wanna jump in on that one? With ideas or to one up it? I think, I mean, to me, the appeal is that large change over time that we is hidden in plain sight. You know, that's always what appeals to me is like, hey, did you know that this did not used to be this way and it was dramatically different and choices led to it being the way it is now? That's always my inclination on that kind of story. That may not be exactly what you're suggesting because I think you're looking at like beyond that, what does it mean that these are built spaces versus not quote unquote natural spaces. Um, maybe that's like urban planning people um, and and maybe some of the people who um, work for environmental contractors who have to do the testing that shows you how the sediment is, is different or is the same in different sediment cores. Is it that's kind of where you're thinking, Teresa, like that level of? Um, some of that, yes. Um... And I guess the other thing that it came from was um, we get a lot of inquiries from places like uh, Cleveland and what was another one? Um, somewhere up north on Lake Superior that want to build things like a, a community sailing center 
um, but they don't have access because we're part of a park and we're on the parks. Their parks don't have the same access. Their shorelines, I think somebody posted public trust doctrine. Um, so the impact of the built environment in two ways, the human addition that our public trust doctrine is even more accessible because we we put in all this fill, but also the environmental impact of something like a built environment that maybe we're not keeping as close track of as we would if it were a natural river or if there was some sort of disaster in it. At the moment, we're you know solid. Um, I mean, it's gross at the bottom, but not more or less than any other area with boats. So yes, and? Yeah, part, I think I can touch on part of that in the access story that I interviewed you for and that I have a couple right. other folks on. But I think what you're suggesting is even beyond that, which could lend itself to like, is there an argument to continue this because we wanna do more in-depth work on, on that front. So I'm excited about that a little bit because I don't have all the answers and I don't even have all the questions to it. So that's what makes me both interested and also a little leery, like, oh, some of these things I feel like I can put in a box and kind of figure out, oh, this is what that story looks like. That one feels a little bit more open-ended, which is, which is interesting to me. I wanna pivot to another post-it note. Let me see, there's a big one in the middle. Overview of green infrastructure being used to prevent sewer overflow. Why is it made? Who is creating it? Who is caring for it? How does it work? Does someone who post, put that on there want to speak to this? Yeah, it's um, that's mine. I think that it's just something that's been coming up a lot as I've been working with you on these different stories. And it seems like something that kind of crosses a lot of different topics. So I think it could be interesting to do an overview. It's also something that we interact with a lot or like maybe see and don't recognize in our public spaces. Um, and it's also an opportunity to kind of like highlight different partnerships. Like when I've talked to Liz at UWM, Liz mentions it. And then I, you know, hear somebody at MMSD who's talking about it. Like there's all these different people in Milwaukee who are, or Reflo is doing big work towards that. So I just feel like there's a lot of players who are thinking about it and it could be an interesting kind of overview or way to bring a lot of people into the mix. It's one of those that's been on my back burner that's it hasn't gone away. I've looked at it as like a GI inventory story, a GI inventory and update. I did uh, speak with uh, Cassie Goodwin at, at um, Smith Group, um, who also pointed to um, the larger projects that MMSD doesn't necessarily consider green infrastructure, even though I would because it involves living components. But they, when they think about bigger things, they don't call it green infrastructure. They're calling it like stormwater basins. But all of that work and like just providing an update, like where are we? In 2013, MMSD put out a plan of, hey, by 2035, we're going to have zero overflows if we have 740 million gallons of green infrastructure storage. Last year, Kevin Schaefer said, hey, we've got 100 million gallons of storage capacity. Um, I would like to just like provide a sense of where are we on that front? And so I, I take your point, and I think you're suggesting an even more nuanced approach of you know, the different entities that are supporting green infrastructure in different ways, which is valuable. And the, the question is like how to do that in 1500 words, or if that means to be multiple 1500 word stories and then how that lives. So I, 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 I want to one up that. I also want to be cognizant that that's a big, a big, um, Milwaukee is doing a lot and there are different partners involved. So then that takes a little bit of time to, to, um, to get into. Um, I'm seeing that's clustered with that 2035 question. So I think that that feels good. I'm looking up at the upper left, there's some new ones. CY, I'm guessing that's Chris Young. Career metaphors, blue, green, turquoise, paths, pipelines, and braided streams. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Chris, take it away. Talk, talk to us about this. Thanks. Hi, everyone. It's good to see lots of familiar faces and a couple of new ones. I'm Chris Young. I'm the director of the Conservation and Environmental Science Program at UW-Milwaukee. And so this is a new role for me, but follows on a lot of things I've been doing over the years. And the the big priority here now is to think about ways that we meet the demand for professionals in the field of environmental science, doing conservation work, doing uh, natural resource management and restoration. And uh, 
you know, I'm just perplexed on both sides with the, the employers and programs that are out there who are looking for qualified people and know that this takes uh, a lot of scientific expertise and also a lot of community engagement skill and, and passion for the work. And on the other side, I'm seeing students and young people wanting to get into the field and trying to figure out their best path and, you know, just seeing all kinds of possibilities going from one to the other, but also lots and lots of obstacles, especially uh, in our in our community where education is so beset by the the kinds of challenges that that we face in in lots of different institutions. So, um, but but I know a lot of the organizations many of you work with have been kind of doing the the STEM education route and have been thinking about ways of training up the next generation. And um, sometimes these metaphors get used and mixed. And um, I'm wondering, you know, what are the, what are the stories that show the real uh, positive flow through the system that really show us where students can enter in lots of different places and emerge with the right credentials, qualifications, professional experiences to to get them entry level jobs and to keep them in the field throughout their career. Well that's a big one, right? Yep. <laughs> I yeah, totally love the idea of the bra the braided river. That is so great. And yeah. uh, you know, I we need to talk. Uh, we're at the School of Freshwater Sciences. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, <laughs> hi, how are you? So, yeah, we, I would love to talk to you about this. This is something that we have been exploring a little bit, and yeah. I call it kind of like a continuum, but we should definitely uh, have a conversation. That's really exciting. Yeah, and I recommend that article. I, I found the link to it. I read it uh, two years ago, and it just has really reshaped the way I think about it. And uh, it, it turns the whole idea of a pipeline into a really problematic kind of thing. Like there's an entry point and everything's going to move right through and it's all going to come out in the same spot. Like, no, realistically, that's, those are not the personal journeys that, um, that people are on. So we need to have lots of entry points, lots of ways through and lots of, um, you know, ways to continue. There's a lot of things I might add on that, but I want to open it up to the floor. If anyone else wants to jump on, I know that the little post-it note for the Environmental Youth Collaborative has been clustered by this. Does anyone want to speak to that with respect to Chris's comments? Uh, yeah, I, I put the Environmental Youth Collaborative. I would I would say in in regards to the thirteen nonprofits that um, are collaborating to support youth in the environmental sector, the additional part of it is you know um, I think. Uh, Folks want to see uh, blue green jobs. Uh, we're talking about this pipeline, but also, um, you know, youth that are supportive of the environmental sector as voters, and and you know, like how we define success in in integrating the environment from a younger age uh, is is certainly on the table for um, you know discussion amongst these nonprofits in particular. Is about you know. If we have youth that know what green infrastructure is, that's success too. And you know they can become bankers or they can become uh, X Y Z, and um, their environmental literacy uh, is important. Um, just as it's important to have folks that are employed in th these blue green jobs as well. Anybody else want to jump in on this one that Chris brought to the table? Because I do feel like it has its own braided stream of possible post-it notes. I mean, I would say at the Sailing Center, one of the reasons why we use STEM um, is because it's the easiest way to get into the schools. Um, if they would let me just come in and talk about how sailing is awesome, I would do that, but they don't. So I talk about the physics of sailing, which means then that the science teachers, the math teachers, physics, chemistry can all justify bringing their kids down, bringing their students down to the lakefront where I put them on boats, which is my real intent. Um, you know, we talk about maritime jobs if anybody asks us. The examples I use are, you know, 
sales are built in, in Wisconsin, boats are built in Wisconsin. We have people who are in the Olympics from Wisconsin who are sailing. Um, but I, I use the career metaphors to get me in the schools because um, we're trying to get we're trying to get kids on the water. So I mean that's a whole true confessions I guess of a nonprofit. Um, you know I know English, so sometimes I just have to Google. You know how smart at physics do I have to be than an eighth grader the day before I go into middle school and you know do my best. Um, and I would love to be able to do more that's actually meaningful because we're not going to get lots of kids. Nobody's making a career in sailing out of Milwaukee. I mean, there's like 10 of us. Um, so what can we do better to make it more meaningful and still get kids on boats? So it depends on what the nonprofits are also trying to do, I guess. I recognize there's some other simmering post-it notes, but I want to keep on this career metaphors one because it also feels to me like the the there's a number of stories there that tie back into other themes here. One is sort of not water related at all in the sense that it's like, what does society expect or support or want and or who is in society wanting or expecting or supporting different things? And is water a rhetorical lever to work on some of those changes. Um, I might suggest that there's evidence that that is the case um, and that is part of this sort of like career metaphor, part of highlighting the idea of the metaphors as a story itself, which is probably not the only story that most people are, are interested in, is very interesting to me because it's like, what story do we tell ourselves about how we relate to an economy to how do we relate to each other? How ought we do those things? And the language that we use does have a um, an impact in that, but it also is responsive to economic and other factors that constrain different choices. So like there's things going all over the place. Nora is, I see Nora, Nora, go for it. Hi, Michael. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I, uh, an idea just popped into my head um, just hearing uh, you and Teresa talk. So um, I am Mexican-American, and what water means to me is completely different than what it means to other cultures and peoples here in Milwaukee. Um, I always tell people, like, in my line of work that I didn't get to see Lake Michigan until I was in middle school just because it was not accessible to people that looked like me and, come, and came from communities like mine. Um, so now that, like, I work in the Harbor District and now that um, that's truly a passion of mine of, like, how do we get people to be feel connected and welcome within um, not only, like, water recreational um uh, just like water recreation or recreational activities here in Milwaukee, but also what what does water mean for cultures? Like I know in the Hmong community, they have a huge tie with water, especially uh, when it comes to death. A lot of Hmong people choose to be buried uh, near the water because it's um, something that's significant to their um, culture. Um, and I, I just learned that when I when I took a tour at the Forest Home Cemetery, because they actually have a pond um, area in the cemetery that's super um, uh, that's super popular within the Hmong community to bury their loved ones. Um, and uh, same with like indigenous peoples, um, black people, um, et cetera. And a lot of us like brown and black folk don't know how to swim. I don't know how to swim. I'm 26 year six years old. When I go to Wisconsin, that was best believe I'm going to put my life jacket on. And it's kind of embarrassing. Like everyone, I'm over there with like five-year-olds with like my life jacket. But in my culture, like that's not seen as important versus in other cultures, people put their babies that are like a few months old like in swimming classes and I'm like how do you do that just like yeah so I think that would be really cool a story on like what does water mean for different cultures um and how does that relate to the bigger picture of being Milwaukee you know so like water in Milwaukee or something like that I think that would be really cool going back to what you said Justin about like lives in the um or I don't know what your post-it note said um I, I don't know where it is but 
um, yeah, like just water means different things to people here in Milwaukee. And I think a lot of nonprofits going to Teresa's point, um, we have a lot of work to do when it comes to aligning that because we have very similar missions, but how we are able to work together to actually accomplish that um, is, is really important. So yeah, I just thought that would be cool to share. Um, because I think that's like a fun way to also uh, get other voices and communities in Milwaukee feel seen when it comes to uh, water. Very cool. At least part of that, I think, can fit with this access equity story that I would like to get out in the next couple of months. And then maybe that it deserves more, excuse me, deserves more um than even that one story can do. Um, I'd, love, <clears throat> I'd love to chat with you maybe more about this or even have your permission to use your comments here as supportive of that story because I'm learning things from what you're talking about in terms of what you've learned at Forest Home Cemetery and, and just your personal story wearing the life jacket, which I think is one of those ways in. You know, if someone shares that kind of story, it opens up other conversations to this is a this is a particular person who is sharing the story. So I. I see that as two things. One, I'd like to use it for fuel for the thing that I think will be written in the next two months. And second, I think we can do more with that. So I appreciate that. I see a raised hand. Uh, Dr. Cool. You're still muted though. Let's see if I can unmute you. Um, yes. There you are. Oh, whoop. Okay. Nope, you're muted again. <laughs> uh, while we're working out that microphone issue, I think uh, disturbance in the AOC to the direct message uh, I was getting was related okay, to- am I there? Yes, you're there now, go for it. Sorry, all I wanted to say was that Carmen, who is a Latina, uh, was on the first and I think only so far Telemundo uh, news segment on local TV about studying water quality in the Milwaukee River. And we were out on the Niske with a whole bunch of students of all different kinds. And we were studying that and it was on NPR and it was on Telemundo. And that kind of stuff I think is relevant to what we were just talking about. I agree. That's very cool. Thank you for that work. Um, I let's see. There's a number of post-it notes. I'm going to drag this one because I haven't read it yet. There was a career sailing group on the Dennis Sullivan, and they handled a lot of kids in the public, but it was boat rides. Model had hope, like sailing club activities, was related to water study, and may have truncated that comment. But I think the Dennis Sullivan, I know, is something that Teresa and I were talking about. I guess they, because they've moved out of town now, but they still do offer some uh, programming. Uh, and I think I think the it, whoever put that comment, do you want to do you want to chime in? Yeah, it was me, Doctor Cool, and I I just we we helped lay the keel for that freaking boat, and it's now in you know uh, Connecticut, uh, which is all fine. Uh, but they had they started doing a lot of education stuff just before Quagga mussels came in. And we gave them a whole section of ways that they could use that as a, as a research education activity, but they failed to keep records and they, they missed it. But I think that there are a lot of things that could be done through the sailing club and through other venues where a simple, small few minutes of an activity that was longer uh, could result in some exciting uh, student and public science. I, I know in our place, when we show a graph that has figures, that has data points colored the same color as the students group that's in it, they get really excited. We talk about how, oh, kids in your group that came two years ago, they did this. And and it, it really hits a strong chord. And in the story that I submitted, uh, I... I quoted you on those comments from the panel that you participated in with with Dataya and and others at the um, Billard Library. So I hopefully that will 
will echo when that comes out. Um, I see a comment from another speaker who hasn't talked yet. Related to the GI Basin comment, the MMSD West Basin construction is set to begin this summer. 30 million gallons capacity. I'm guessing that's Sarah Brigant. Uh, also, we have about five minutes left. So, Sarah, if you want to speak up. Um, sure. Yeah, I I mean, just that the West Basin planning has been ongoing. Uh, this is at 35th and Congress, the third in a series of stormwater basins that MMSD is working on. Um, Northwest Side CDC, of course, assisting with the outreach for that. But have been hearing that construction crews will start moving soil this summer. So maybe if there's, you know, a way to incorporate that as kind of a timely article, I'm sure there'll be, you know, groundbreaking and press events. So maybe it'll get out there anyway. But uh, just because I know we were having that discussion about overflows and about that, I kind of refer to it as like a hybrid gray green infrastructure because it does include um, obviously new sewer infrastructure, but also lots of trees, native plants, uh, bios whales and things like that. So, yeah. Thank you for that. I, my, for my part in the short term, I would like to talk about the large scale infrastructure planned or implemented throughout the city, um, including 33 corridor. Um, and then I think the timing may not quite be right for covering the actual construction, but I think when there is another, um, public point to anchor to, as you suggest, that's, it's always a good thing. And I'll just from a personal professional perspective, I'll continue to reiterate that I really feel there could be value in inviting people to try to name that space. Um, I know that's not necessarily my purview as someone writing about stuff, but um, as as a member of this conversation, I think West Basin means something to some people, but doesn't mean anything to most of us. And it would be really exciting to name that space or to have people participate in naming it. So I'll I know I've said that before, but I wanted to put that on the record here. Um, yeah, ab a... absolutely. Good good point. And yes, I mean, we we definitely hear that. I don't think West Basin will stick <laughs> long term, but there's still, yeah, quite a bit to do as far as um, kind of that branding of what the future kind of park space, the trail space, all of that in the corridor. So just not quite at that moment in time, but your comment is heard. Cool. Thank you. Um, I'm... This is more than a more like a comment than a, a story idea, I believe. Amusing how little res restoration and related interests actually interact with active empirical scientists who study our local ecosystems. Um, if we could have brief comment on that, um, is that doc is that you, Doctor Cool, or is that something yeah, else? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's just something that raises the hair on the back of my neck when I see a lot of uh, rhetoric that is not always substantially based in fact when the facts are right downstairs. Okay, I mean, we have we have several agencies here that do a lot of public outreach, so to speak. And uh, it's, it's amusing how they have never come and talked to us. And our area is littered with posters about scientific measurements and the concepts, and it's not all psychobabble and it's in the hall and anybody can see it. So I just, it's amusing, that's all. But I do wanna say the thing about winter and that is just in one sentence, this is the first time in the 30 years I've been here that the big Lakers never pulled into the Harbor. Okay, and there has been no ice and we've done a whole bunch of radio and TV stuff on it, but I think it's not gonna be the last time. I wanna recognize Yvonne who has her hand up? Can you unmute? Okay, um, just very briefly, I wanted to add to Sarah Brigant's comments about the West Basin. It goes further than the West Basin. It actually is the corridor uh, inclusive. There are other uh, projects along the corridor um, and I'll just leave it at that. I was trying to add to her post-it note, but couldn't get that going. So Sarah or somebody, however you want to add that. There's a larger story there in the corridor. And we can have that conversation later. That sounds good. And I Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, Absolutely. Cool. I appreciate the comment, indeed. Yes. Yes. Have I missed any post-it notes that anyone who is present would like to speak to? 
Yes, if the phytoplankton so, one. <laughs> phytoplankton one. It's a green one. Um, I called it, uh, trying to be cute, and called it Let's Talk Phytoplankton. Okay. And the reason I put that is that um, as we get nutrients, and as you know, we're going to be uh, starting some of these things, a, a lot of the people don't really quite understand why phytoplankton is important and is kind of like the plants of the, of the water. And so I just wanted to uh, educate people, and that's something we have been talking about, uh, how uh, if we talk about algal blooms, for example, the one we had last summer was a very benign one because it was diatoms. And not all blooms, when we say, oh, there's a lot of density, uh, are nauseous or toxic. So kind of like for people to embrace that the phytoplankton and the zooplankton and the fish in there are super important in that kind of stuff. Very cool. Thank you. I'm sorry that I missed that. I was grouping that no, in appropriately. Okay. So that's, that's I, okay. and that, that feels to me like the, the big takeaway here is it does feel like there's vitality to look for support to continue this kind of work because of the energy shared in this call. It does feel like there's a number of topics that could be explored to greater depth and that there's interest in potential partners in supporting those stories. And it does feel like there's more that needs to be done to um, to either tell or explore or expose some of these stories. So I'm, I'm sensing that there is energy here um, at a high level. Um, I haven't been able to keep up in all the chat, so I apologize if I'm missing direct commentary. Anyone else have a comment to make for a story idea or event that you would like to plug? Recognizing we have one minute till 4.30, so folks need to head out, feel free to do so. I see sure, cruise ships. If nobody's talking. Uh, what if we designed a one hour program that went on the high speed ferry? Uh, I've already got them to agree that they would give us the screens with no sound for one hour in the middle of their two and a half hour trip. And we have videos of the bottom and we have a lot of science of the water columns and, and climate in Lake Michigan. We could have a quiet show that was really fun for people, but that uh, would get at a lot of people. That's interesting. It's a very specific audience. Um, I'd be game to discuss that. I know we're chatting next week. Maybe that's uh, on our on our agenda. Um, and I, I've only been on the ferry once, but I know what you're talking about. Like in that big open area, it's like you're sitting in a bus terminal and the screens are on. So why not use that to our advantage, right? Teresa loves it. <laughs> there you go. Maybe maybe that's uh, maybe that could get support by uh, a lot of the, or a number of the NGOs who have some kind of stake in the game as well to kind of rotate through, kind of like your in-flight magazine. You know, it's like the equivalent of an in-flight magazine, but for the ferry. Um, right. <laughs> thank you for that, that's a cool suggestion. Have I missed anyone else's uh, notes that you would like to say were over time, so I wanna respect folks' time for the formal event? Just to note, uh, there are several events. There's a kind of a column there of post-it notes with uh, several upcoming events uh, that folks added there. Detea, I think I, I see you have. Uh, this is, I can actually talk to the, I, um, so on Monday, the in the City Hall Rotunda, there will be uh, Domini uh, Jawadarna, I might be pronouncing her name poorly, had worked with the neighbors in Lindsay Heights to do a photo voice experience, where which will be on display for the week next week with a reception on um, at six, I believe six p.m. on Monday. Um, so that's kind of a, a cool thing. They they went around Lindsay Heights to identify opportunities and positives as well as uh, challenges from an urban environmental context and its residents who took their own photos and contextualized them. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. There is a um, Strong Minds, which is a native-led organization, is doing a sunrise uh, walk on the 20th of April, um, a sturgeon walk. I don't have a whole lot of details on that, but I plan to be present to see what I can observe and share. Um, 
There is a, a watermarks walk in, a, a, in Pulaski Park on the 27th of April, um, shared by Haley, which will involve uh, artist Yezi Perez um, and uh, health scientist Dr. Kirsten Beyer in a, a walk that is open to the public. Uh, there is a green tech station volunteer and bench unveiling event on May 4th. Um, I don't know if the GSCM schoolyards tour is open to the public, but it's a note that is supporting our Green and Healthy Schools National Context story and that there are guests from the Children and Nature Network from across the country who will be visiting Milwaukee Public Schools on the 28th of May. And then I don't know if anyone is present who knows more details, but I had a note in my calendar that on the 15th of June, there was to be a Lincoln Creek Greenway Summit. So I have that saved the date, but I don't have any details on that. That's what I'm aware of from those post-it notes um, for those who are curious. I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming. I'd like to remain present for anyone who wants to follow up with me briefly after this session, but I wanna kind of bang the gavel and let folks go because we're after 4.30 out of respect of your time. Well, for my part, I will copy these notes uh, into a way that we can share with everyone who participated in case you'd like to do your own follow-ups. And then I will use these um, to see what I can look into over the next coming weeks and months. But thank you for your participation and your interest and feel free to follow up by email uh, if there are any other questions or ideas. So have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you.